Have you, uh, uh, oh, I got a question. Have you been experiencing increased fireworks activity? No. No. Because you, nope. you, are you aware that this is happening all across the nation? Nope. First I've heard of it. Oh, really? Okay. Well, it's pretty yeah. much, it's pretty much the consensus uh, of, of people online, I guess, if that's a, if that's any sort of cross section of Americans uh, that, and I've seen a couple of news articles about it as well, uh, that there is increased fireworks activity all across the nation and nobody's quite sure why it is. What are the theories that people are floating? Oh, well, there's a couple. Uh, one is some sort of change in the supply chain, right? So like either they got them out for 4th of July earlier this year or they're cheaper for whatever reason uh, or there's some special coupon. I don't know. Or the the real hardcore conspiracy theorists are saying that the police are doing it to create an excuse uh, to go into certain areas or to use more extreme measures for uh, uh, cracking down on protests, which it's you know, rather conspiratorial. It is. It is kind of conspiratorial. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I know from my perspective uh, here in Duluth, Minnesota, uh, we absolutely have significantly more fireworks to the degree that uh, next door, which uh, I pay attention to because um, it's it's fun to like uh, track the the kind of little fascist tendencies and people in the neighborhood <laughs> because all they do is uh, complain about other people and like surveil them and, and talk about calling the police. Uh, the solution to every problem on next door is call the police, uh, which is messed I up. I hate next door. It's very bad. Next, yeah. Um, yeah. It is really, really a toxic ecosystem. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's basically been given over to people complaining about fireworks at this point. Um, yeah. What's the mask situation like where you are? I was talking to my mom on the phone today and like we were talking about what it's like where she lives, which is I, I'm from just outside of Pittsburgh. And so we were talking about how many people are wearing masks there and how many people are wearing masks. Are, are they here. Are, are they wearing masks there? She says they are, but she also lies to me because she's old and she knows that I worry about her. And so she she sugarcoats everything she tells me about the virus. Um, mm. But from what she says, uh, the answer is yes. So I don't know. Hmm. So so Joe, I don't I don't mean to dox you, but you're in you're in Madison, Wisconsin. I'm in Duluth, Minnesota, which is significantly smaller. Duluth is a pretty small place. Um, what's your mass compliance like? Give me a percentage. Pretty high. Pretty high. Well, College I mean, town. Uh, l- yeah. let me say, let me say this. I don't really know because I barely leave my house. Oh, really? And when I do leave my house, it's to go on walks in the park. And there, you know, it's like people are social distancing and it's outside. So some people have masks, some people don't. I think that like in, in public, my sense is like I have gotten like curbside take out and these things and and people are always pretty diligent about the masks. I think that there's a high adoption rate for masks. What about you? That's interesting. Um it varies. I've noticed a lot of fluctuations and it seems like it uh it like it seems like it goes along with the news cycle. But you know, I was talking to our friend uh I was talking to our friend Paul uh the other day and uh he does a lot of work on uh right populism. And uh, one of the weird things that's happening, I, weird is not the right word, I guess, uh, like disgusting, uh, terrible, immoral, uh, I guess, <laughs> be like things that's happening right now is the that um, the right, the, the, the fringe right, like the conspiracy right, who thinks that uh, coronavirus is not real and that nobody should ever wear masks is appropriating uh, the slogan, I can't breathe. Uh, to complain about wearing masks. Oh my god, is, that's too too perfect in all its horror. I can't, like I almost you, it's like you couldn't design anything more uh, offensive than that. Welcome to Zero Sum Empire, the podcast that's taking a critical census of the roughly 640 mostly anonymous American billionaires. 
Hi, everybody. I'm Chad. Uh, that that was Chad, and I'm Joe. And uh, you are correct. There are roughly 640 uh, American billionaires. 643, according to the latest tally. Um, hmm. But it did dip during the, the COVID crash to 614. That's a significant dip. Yeah, so 30 billionaires. I wonder if we're being too hard on billionaires on the show. No, no, we're you know, not. I mean, if and, they can go from billionaires <laughs> to not billionaires and in, in just a one little pandemic. Absolutely not. Uh, in fact, this is a great segue uh, into the news. Billionaires in the news. Uh, so there's really only one story to talk about with billionaires right now, I guess, which is like their relationship to coronavirus and uh, and how they're faring in this new world that we find ourselves in. I guess on balance, are they are they faring better or worse? Well, you might think that like their fortunes would rise and fall uh, with the rest of uh, Americans fortunes. Uh, but it turns out that's not the case. Uh, they're doing great. A, a whole bunch of articles have come out about how the billionaire class is faring during coronavirus. And so I, I, I went through a bunch of them, collected a bunch of facts, and I thought I could just sort of let you know uh, what some of the facts about how billionaires have have uh, fared during coronavirus are? All right, um, lay lay some facts on me. Okay. Um. Yeah. You know, one of the you know we're going to link to this in the show notes, but one of the uh, really good ones is uh, the Institute for Policy Studies came out with a report called Billionaire Bonanza, and uh, it uh, it does a really nice breakdown of uh, billionaire finances during uh, the coronavirus crisis. Um, but there are a whole bunch of other ones out there. And so I'm going to draw from a few. Uh, maybe we'll link to okay. those too. Uh, so I, I was just, as I just said, uh, uh, the, the billionaire class has mostly recovered. In fact, they're, they're way beyond recovering uh, from the coronavirus crash. Um, they're, since the, the beginning of the year, um, their wealth has cumulatively increased 20%. Uh, or $584 billion, uh, over half a trillion dollars, has been added to the collective wealth of billionaires since the beginning of 2020. But American households uh, as a whole lost $6.5 trillion during the same period. Uh, so the overall wealth of Americans uh, is going down a lot. And the overall wealth of billionaires is going up a lot. One way to look at that, if you look at it in a zero sum way, right? Like one way to look at that is that that is a transfer of wealth from everybody else uh, to the billionaires. Right? They're making money while other people are losing money. The unemployment rate went from about 2% before the crisis to about, as we probably all know, to about 15% uh, at its height. During that same period, Right. Uh, since the, the bottom to the top uh, uh, or from the bottom to now, rather, the number of U.S. billionaires increased from 614 to 643. Same period, 45.5 million people filed for unemployment. So, How does that make you feel during the period where American households lost six point five trillion dollars in wealth and forty five point five million people filed for unemployment? Billionaires wealth collectively went up 20 percent. Six hundred billion dollars. I mean, it makes me it makes me feel sick and angry. I guess I've just kind of come to terms with this is how the world has been working. I don't want it to continue to work this way. That, that's the weird thing, right? Like, I I think that I, I think that's how, that's how sort of like most of us respond to it, right? Like that. Well, this is this is how the world is structured. This happens over and over again, right? It happened with the financial crisis in uh, two thousand seven to two thousand nine, right? It it uh, it just kind of consistently happens, uh, no matter how the economy goes. Uh, there's more and more wealth that gets filtered to the top 0.1% of people. And it just keeps happening. So we sort of accept it. But if you pull back from that for a minute and think about how unbelievably insane it is that during a global pandemic, when the entire uh, global economy is in a state of meltdown, uh, when you have greater than uh, depression level eras of unemployment, that at that time, the return on investment for the richest of the rich for the for the elite is uh is greater 
than it is during other times, right? Like they're making... Right. I mean, at the same time, it's not surprising. The whole idea of disaster capitalism, which Naomi Klein talked about how many years ago? 20 years ago now, you know, is is has been proven to play out the way that it does again and again and again. People who don't have access to like large sums of capital aren't in a position to make big moves. But when the world is changing quickly and you have access to capital and p- perhaps better information than other people, this is a prime opportunity to just score windfalls. Yep. Like we yep. know this. And so it's, uh, you know, I think I would have been more surprised if it had gone the other way. <laughs> right. You know, right, that's really, right. that's really depressing. If it, if it went like, the other way, like, I would be really surprised. It also seems like the richer you are, the more rich you get. So Bezos, Gates, Zuckerberg, Buffett, and Ellison, those are the five top billionaires. Their wealth went up much more than the average. Uh, and their wealth grew by 26% uh, uh, over that same period. So uh, uh, do you want to know who the biggest the biggest profiteers uh, during coronavirus are? Sure. There's some of our favorites. There's some who who come up again and again. Uh, and we already mentioned Jeff Bezos, and he's profited the most by far. Uh, he added he's added 34 billion to his wealth so far this year. <laughs> right. So um, uh, it's understandable. I mean, like that's the easiest one to see coming. Right. It's e- it's easy to see coming. I mean, it, it is worth noting. Right. Like, obviously, there are some natural market phenomena that would that would privilege a business like Amazon right now. Right. That, that uh, people staying in their homes creates a space for more deliveries. Right. Like that's that's obvious. Right. But at the same time, um, uh, Jeff Bezos, as it's well known, did not do much to protect workers. Uh, there are outbreaks in Amazon facilities instead of uh, protecting workers from covid. Uh, what he did was pledge. Uh, some money to feeding America, which is nice, but it turns out it was a uh, a, a minuscule amount. Uh, that uh, uh, the Washington Post did this uh, interesting thing where they took uh, billionaire donations and translated them into how much it would uh, be for what they called the median American. Uh, and and I don't know how they determined what the median American is, but the income was a hundred thousand dollars, which uh, I guess they must have factored in the billionaires to their calculation of what the median American, not the average. Yeah, I get they must because um, that doesn't seem very average. Right? Anyway. No, uh, that's a lot of money. So even for someone making a hundred thousand dollars a year, uh, 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 Bezos's uh, contribution would I think it was like eighty five dollars. Uh, equal to eighty five dollars. Like most most billionaires in, in the 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 Washington Post calculations, most billionaires have donated the equivalent of zero to five dollars uh, in relative terms. So relative to the median American who makes a hundred thousand uh, dollars, they've they've donated zero to five dollars on, on the. Average. That is. Th- that's an amazing. That's an amazing fact. The one exception, though, uh, you know, the, the one strange exception is Jack Dorsey uh, of Twitter. Um, he gave away a billion dollars to COVID causes, which which <laughs> equates to twenty eight percent of his entire net worth. Um, he that's just pretty. That's pretty good. He picked this moment to make the big donation. Uh, and he wrote like this letter that that he hopes that this uh, influences other billionaires and causes them to donate in a similar way to like public health or whatever. And like nobody, <laughs> no, maybe, nobody listened. It's, and they, uh, like, it's interesting. I mean, that's 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 good. That's obviously a good thing. I just I, I go back to the point we've made before on the show, which is like billionaires don't really get to be billionaires in the way that they'd like to be billionaires if everyone else is starving or dead. And so in a certain way, ruling over a kingdom of sick and dying people is is not exactly uh, the uh, uh, it's not the dream. The despots ideal. Right. Like, <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. But anyway, so I mean, like that, that's uh, I, I you know, I think that it, it was. Oh, oh, the one that we skipped um, the, after Bezos, the second biggest profiteer and the person to add percentage wise the most to his wealth uh, somehow. Elon Musk's wealth has increased 55% since the start of the year. Did you get that article I sent you about how Tesla is I did. Like coming in worst in everything? So so there's a massive survey of um uh, uh, of car buyers um and 
out of, and they they ask them how many problems they've had with their cars. And out of all cars like that exist, Tesla came in dead last. <laughs> again and again. <laughs> <laughs> Owners report 250 problems per 100 vehicles. So so each vehicle has 2.5 problems. Which I guess means like your car breaks down two and a half times a year or something like <laughs> I don't know what it means, but like uh, so so on the average, the, those cars have uh, far more problems than others. Uh, but like also, Elon Musk has been doing a lot of very weird stuff. Like, did you see that he announced he was selling off all of his worldly possessions? And like, I did see that. It was like yeah. a I thought it was like a joke tweet, but then he listed all of his houses, his mansions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know. I mean, and then he had like the the whole CPAP machine thing that we talked about before. Like, it seems like he's just been fucking up over and over again. But it's for some reason, people are buying what he's shoveling. So, Chad, I I really can't remember who you're talking about today. I know that it, the the person is the owner of the, the San Francisco 49ers, which will become important during my segment as well. But other than that, I can't remember the name, and I can't really remember what's going on. Yeah, um, yeah. So, for those of you who didn't tune, uh, didn't stay till the bitter end of the last uh, episode. Um, the person that, or we both pulled, uh, NFL team owners, uh, coincidentally, uh, uh, and mine is, her name is Denise York. Uh, although she's often identified as Denise DeBartolo York, her, uh, maiden name, uh, DeBartolo, uh, or as we would call it from uh, where I grew up, DeBartolo. Um, and, uh, if you are a fan of the San Francisco 49ers, then that name DeBartolo does mean a lot to you, uh, because her brother, Eddie De- DeBartolo Jr. was a storied and beloved, uh, owner of that team for a really long time. There's not a lot, like many of the billionaires that we cover on this show, there's not a ton of information about her out there. There's a little more, uh, than, than a lot of other people, but that has mainly to do with how well known her family members were. For her, like, you know, like there are a couple of things to know. Like the the main thing to know about Denise de Bartolo York is that she's from Youngstown. And that's mostly what I'm going to talk about today is Youngstown, Ohio. She owns the 49ers. Uh, she used to run the Pittsburgh Penguins. They're not from San Francisco. Uh, the entire it's not just Denise uh, who is from Youngstown. The entire family is from there. Uh, they own the Pittsburgh Penguins. Uh, San Francisco 49ers and the Pittsburgh Maulers. Uh, do you remember the Pittsburgh Maulers, Joe? No, I don't know anything about the Pittsburgh Maulers. I do know a thing or two about Youngstown, or actually, I don't. I used to just drive past it. Oh, the okay. Night well, I'll, I'll ask you about that when we get to the Youngstown portion of uh, uh, of this segment. Um, okay. But uh, uh, the the Maulers were a USFL team. Um, do you, the USFL and United States Football League. I think it, you know it stands for. I guess uh, was like it was like a 1980s uh, competitor to the NFL, and they uh, it it lasted a very short period of time, maybe like two years, and uh, then went bankrupt. And uh, hilariously, uh, the reason that it went bankrupt was because of my and your president, uh, Donald J. Trump. Uh, he. The USFL had this business plan going into starting the league where they were like, okay, well, people love football so much that when the NFL season is not happening, we'll have another league and it'll just sort of be like a a smaller league, but it'll still be entertaining and people will like it. Uh, And Donald Trump was like, no, we need to compete directly with the NFL. And so he forced somehow the league to change its season to the fall so that it was directly competing with the NFL. And then the NFL immediately crushed it and it went bankrupt <laughs> and died. <laughs> um, and, you know, okay. and, and so like uh, that, that's the USFL. So like the, the interesting, the interesting angle about Denise to Bartolo York is the way that she ended up coming to own 49ers, San Francisco 49ers in the first place. 
And like the, the doing research on her and like finding this out, finding out that she came to own them through a, a strange series of events led me down a, a research rabbit hole that uh, was kind of mind blowing and uh, and and took me into the seedy underbelly of Youngstown, Ohio. And it, it, it it's I'm, I was like just transfixed for like two weeks reading about <laughs> Youngstown. Uh, which is only, you know, it's only an hour from where I grew up, uh, but weirdly I've never been there. Uh, and so we're mostly going to spend our time talking about Youngstown. Uh, well, Joe, you said that you, uh, you had experienced Youngtown, Youngstown to some degree. You spent the night there. What was it like? Was it, uh, on a, well, on a scale you know, so, of one uh, like, to 10, <laughs> what would, would you, <laughs> how would you rate Youngstown's curb appeal? So you didn't, you didn't like really get to know the town, but what did it seem like? Um, well, I mean, I've driven past Youngstown uh, many dozens of times because I've lived in that part of the world uh, for a lot of my life. But the night in question, my now wife, girlfriend at the time had food poisoning mm -hmm. and she was vomiting, projectile vomiting all over my 1990 Volvo and we had to get off the highway as soon as possible. And this is how most people actually see the inside of Youngstown. It's usually some sort of diarrhea or vomit emergency that happens on the highway. <laughs> and then you you are forced to pull in. Maybe you get a flat tire. Some emergency forces you yeah, to. Yeah, we were for, I mean, it was the probably the worst night of her life. <laughs> I mean, that night it was absolutely insane because it was an emergency deal. I didn't see any of Youngstown at all, except for the inside of a pharmacy where I was trying to get something to help my wife not experience pain. And that was my experience of Youngstown. That sounds um, terrifying and horrible. Um, <laughs> the, so the, the way that we get to Youngstown is through Denise DeBartolo York and her brother, Eddie DeBartolo Jr., uh, known as Eddie D uh, to 49ers fans. So Eddie D was beloved. He sort of like shepherded the 49ers through all of their championships in the 80s and 90s. I don't, I'm not sure uh, when it was, but they had like this dynasty going on. He got banned from the league uh, when he was convicted uh, of giving a $400,000 bribe to then Louisiana Governor Edwin Edwards uh, in 1998. And this is remarkably consistent with everything that I have come to know about the NFL. I'm surprised that that got him kicked out, honestly. <laughs> yeah. So why did he bribe the governor of Louisiana? Uh, it was to get a riverboat casino license. And uh, it, it, after hearing that, you might ask yourself, why would Eddie, Eddie D. DeBartolo Jr. of Youngstown, Ohio, uh, an owner of the San Francisco 49ers won a Louisiana riverboat casino. And uh, I'll take this opportunity to ask you a completely unrelated question, Joe. Have you ever seen the show Ozark? No. I've seen it come up on Netflix. Like, do you want to watch Ozark? And I've always said, nah. Well, the premise of the show is that uh, the main character goes to the Ozarks and buys a casino or builds a casino uh, and then uses the remoteness of the casino uh, in Missouri and the the fact that casinos do a lot of like cash business and there's a lot of money moving into and out of them really quickly to launder money for the mafia. Well, well to launder money for a drug cartel in that instance. Um, I don't know why Eddie D uh, wanted to get a Louisiana casino. I don't have any reason to think that it was a money. Well, I, I don't have any evidence to suggest that it was a money laundering operation. It just seems like a little bit Weird, and I'll just ask you to kind of keep that factoid about his interest in, in doing that in the back of your mind for later. Um, anyway, the governor, Edwin Edwards, went to jail uh, for that for like eight to 10 years. It was a pretty long time. Uh, and he went to jail based mainly on Eddie DeBartolo's testimony against him. So Eddie, when he got busted, turned against, he, he became a rat. He became Eddie the Rat. That was an official moniker? Eddie the Rat? No, that's just that. That's just me calling him that. Um, yeah. He uh, he got off. It sounded like it could have been a thing. Yeah, <laughs> he, he had to pay a million dollars in fines, and he was on probation for three years. But he didn't actually have to spend time in prison. 
uh, whereas the the Edward the governor uh, got in a, in a lot of trouble. And this you know this whole like event oh never sat well uh, with Eddie. He was very bitter about it because he was sort of forced into a position of having to give the NFL team the the Forty Nine ers over to his sister, and they had all of these legal battles later on. Uh, where he tried to sue his sister to get control of the team back, even though like the NFL didn't want him there. And so uh, there's this really amazing quote from him. Uh, this is actually, I just, it, it's on Wikipedia under his bio for some reason, but th- this quote quotation is great of him it, it, talking this extremely, and this is going to be a, this is going to be something that comes up a number of times throughout uh, this segment is like, the sort of Trumpian vibe, the Trumpian energy of Youngstown is very, very thick and present. Uh, so this is Eddie DeBarlow talking about the, who is still alive, right? Like, he, and this is not that long ago, him talking about what happened. He says, quote, truthfully, the team really wasn't taken away from me. I think it's been a misnomer for many, many years. Commissioner Tagliabue did obviously suspend me but as I was going through negotiations with my family and we went through these negotiations and we went through them with lawyers, obviously, and with a judge in Akron, Ohio, it did not come down to that team being taken. It came down to a decision that had to be made whether or not I wanted the 49ers or whether or not I wanted to take the other part of the company. And I figured... At that time, my sister Denise, uh, she she was total. Uh, sorry, my sister Denise was totally involved. Uh, as was her family. Like I'm losing my place. It doesn't make any sense. I decided in that meeting, which meeting in Akron, Ohio, that I thought it would be best that I took the other side of the business, and my tenure with the 49ers would end, and end there. I don't know if that story has ever been told. It may have been. It may not have been. <laughs> but it really was a choice. I figured there was that more. Is, <laughs> that is Trumpian rhetoric. I don't know if it's ever. Maybe. Maybe not. But I, yeah. and, and so like he goes on and he says, like it, basically, he's saying, I wanted to spend more time with my family. And so I voluntarily chose to not uh, own and run the 49ers anymore, uh, which is just such a like a weird thing to be hung up on 20 years later. So he had to give up the 49ers and and if you if when I like I'm talking about Eddie DeBartolo right now and and if his name sounds familiar to you uh, it is kind of like a movie name and so it maybe just sounds familiar to me cuz like Eddie D Eddie DeBartolo you know it sounds like just a, a character on the Sopranos Right yeah yeah um but you may have actually heard his name because he was in the news recently um uh Trump pardoned him from this specific crime of bribing this this governor. Oh so Trump has a direct connect of course he does. Yeah yeah they of were USFL buddies. So Eddie Sr, not Eddie Jr was the one who started the business that made the family rich, right? Like Eddie Jr and and Denise like they didn't do a lot, you know, when it came to like building the business. It was uh something that their father started and they kind of inherited from him. Um he was a construction contractor. Uh, he mainly built shopping malls, uh, and these were shopping malls all over the country, every uh, in every state. You know, they're they're everywhere. Do you remember my guy David Simon? Well, okay, yes, I do. Uh, De Bartolo sold the company to David to Simon Simon Properties. Uh, so Simon is now by oh. far, I think, the largest you know, re- commercial space, you know, kind of a uh, uh, real estate company. There are you know, I just saw a headline related to this, to this, uh, to that episode. And Simon Property Group is just in the last day or two. I saw this too. Uh, it's being reported that they're, they're suing Brooks Brothers in the Gap for unpaid rent in the aftermath oh, of COVID. That is not what I saw. I saw a different story about Simon Property, which was that they were, trying to do some merger with another property company and it fell through and they claimed that the reason that they were allowed, and I'm not sure if this was Simon or the other company, but the reason that the company was allowed to back out of the deal was because of unforeseen circumstances that occurred because of coronavirus. So Youngstown was a steel town and in its heyday, the, the max population was about 160,000 people. After the Did steel Did it compete crash, with, with Pittsburgh for steel or was it just a large steel bubble? It was a it was a steel I mean, bubble. Pittsburgh so is much road, much right? larger. 
Uh, Pittsburgh is much bigger than than. So currently, Youngstown is smaller than than my tiny hamlet of Duluth, Minnesota. Uh, currently, Youngstown is under sixty thousand people, I believe. Uh, very small. Huh. Uh, this the steel collapse just crushed it, uh, and and over half of the population moved away uh, in like a decade, huh. and it's still shrinking. Um, and so it was never really that big. Uh, uh, Eddie senior kind of, uh, he, he started to become rich in the sixties and then really became rich in the seventies and eighties, uh, in, in the mall business. Uh, and so you might wonder why this guy from a relatively small place in the middle of Ohio, uh, became, uh, the largest shopping mall construction contractor in the United States. Uh, well, the, the one possible answer to that, uh, although it's never been proven uh is that uh one could argue that it's very likely <laughs> that uh that the debartolo contracts uh uh construction contracts were controlled by the mafia and to understand why i would make that assumption or why would i make i would make that inference uh, it's important to know a couple of things about youngstown as a city because it's an unusual place Little Chicago, just one of many labels the city of Youngstown has worn over the years. Steeltown was the most noble. It reflected the very essence of this community. Its strong ethnic mix produced a tough blue-collar class of people who worked hard by day and played just as hard by night. Okay, I just want to flag that uh, weird comment that the narrator of this old movie made, which is <laughs> strong ethnic mix. Uh, that sounds extremely racist extremely fucked up uh but uh, let's continue to liken a small city like youngstown to a major one might engender a burst of civic pride but the analogy to chicago was not meant to be complimentary it's just that both cities were infested with murderous gangsters <laughs> <laughs> oh wow yeah wow. Um, <laughs> so cool. for most of the 20th century we're talking basically from prohibition from the beginning of prohibition to like the late 1980s youngstown ohio and many people i think don't know this i didn't know this i knew uh uh youngstown had probably the highest per capita participation in mafia activities of any American city. It was, it has variously been known as bomb town after a string of 80 unsolved bombings in the 1950s. What? Uh, murder city. Uh, after the having the nation's highest murder rate for uh, a little while, which was uh, pinned to the Naples Carabia uh, mafia war in the seventies uh, and eighties. Uh, and the one that stuck the longest and the one that's most often known by uh, outside of its proper name, Crime Town USA. Um, so I'm actually uh, drawing some of the information here from a book called Crime Town USA, uh, a history of the month. Seems like it should be a TV series called Bomb Town. It absolutely should, because, I mean, we're talking like you could do a multi- it was three generations of people, right? So it it started depending on which source you read. Like I saw, I saw sources arguing that the mafia had basically taken over the city by as early as like 1910. Um, but I think basically it's like the 20s and 30s. It really starts going, and then after Prohibition, uh, it it moves into new areas like drugs, prostitution, that kind of thing, and really accelerates and takes over the city. Well, it makes perfect sense because it's sort of on a path between Chicago and back East, but it's not like a major city. So it's a little bit below the radar. Okay. You know, like I lived in Erie for a little while and I know that Erie was also like a meeting place for gangsters to have meetings. It wasn't necessarily yeah. like a mafia hub, but it, it, it's like geographically situated in a similar area. You're right in a larger sense in the, in the sense that like it had to do with proximity. It had to do with its specific geography. 
But it was less its relationship to Chicago and more that it's one hour from Cleveland and one hour from Pittsburgh by car. It's immediate. It's an, it's it's uh, like exactly in the middle of those two cities. And the Cleveland Mafia and the Pittsburgh Mafia were pretty large and they were kind of constantly battling in Youngstown for, you know, various, you know, markets and, and things like that. Um, and so like the the. Mafia war that I mentioned a moment ago, the thing that gave, gave it the moniker Murder City in the 70s, uh, was a, a mafia war between uh, the Carabia brothers and the Naples family. I think the Naples family were out of Cleveland and the Carabias were out of Pittsburgh. I might have that reversed, but it, so it was sort of a proxy war for Cleveland and Pittsburgh. Huh. Um, which themselves are not like incredibly large cities. It's just that Youngstown was so small that like the per capita number of mafia people in uh, in the city was like much higher than than anywhere else. Right. You know, the thing that you have to know about Youngstown is that the mafia owned it at every level. Everything that I've read has been like Youngstown was a mafia state. There was like the the police, the judges, the law, everybody just was the mafia. And when it came to doing the law the mafia got a free pass and in fact wrote the law in in many cases right like like to a greater degree than they did in other places so anyway there like there's a ton of lore here and i would encourage anybody to just like read about the youngstown mafia cuz it was it was just i i can't like i can't go into a million sort of like stories uh about youngstown lore uh but but it it is great i'm just going to talk about one and it's and it's the one that's relevant to the de bartolo family uh and that is uh, the Carabia crime family. Uh, the Carabia ca- crime family was um, uh, made up of three brothers, uh, Charlie, uh, Lenny, and Ronnie Carabia. And they were dominant in Youngstown in the 1970s and 80s. Uh, the, the, pre- the mafia war that I mentioned a moment ago between Pittsburgh and Cleveland crews uh, actually ended up with Charlie Carabia getting killed. And uh, his brother, Ronnie, was very close friends growing up with Eddie Jr., Eddie DeBartolo Jr. And, and, and this is I'm actually a little proud of myself because I, 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 was, I did research on these guys uh, as individuals. They're both still alive. And they both live in Florida, about a half an hour away from each other. <laughs> and <laughs> I do not think that that is a coincidence. Uh, they live in out in Tampa, and uh, and Ronnie lives outside of Sarasota, like uh, about a half. An Interesting. Hour. Yeah. So Eddie Senior was so close with the Carabia family uh, that uh, there is. There's even there's an FBI wiretap of a conversation that was recorded between two other mob guys uh, talking about how they set up a meeting between Eddie Sr. and this mob lawyer to do a deal of some kind. I, the details don't really matter. But according to uh, one source that I've seen, and this is a single source uh, of information, but I think it's credible. Eddie Sr. has been named by in FBI documents. Uh, like in all sorts of stuff, uh, money laundering, gun running, embezzlement, all of that stuff is from a, a single book by this guy, Dan Moldea, who's an investigative journalist. And and he is citing a lone FBI agent in a lot of that stuff. And so, you know, like, you know, we'd like to be responsible researchers here. And so I just want to sort of caveat uh, that stuff with with the fact that I actually only found that corroborated. I, I didn't find it corroborated. I only found it in a single source. Regardless, though. The Carabias and the DeBartolos were very close. In addition, Joe, one last piece of interesting circumstantial evidence for the DeBartolos' reliance on organized crime. Uh, when Eddie Sr. bought the 49ers, uh, he sent a guy named Carmen Policy, uh, P-O-L-I-C-Y, so it's a kind of Americanization of an Italian name. Yeah, he sent a guy named Carmen Policy out to be the general counsel of the 49ers. And the thing that Carmen Policy did prior to that was he was famous for being the mob lawyer for uh, the Youngstown Mafia. And, Whoa. you know, he got he got his law degree. That's kind of interesting. From, he got his law degree from Youngstown State, right? He's not some sort of like genius boy. He's not an Ivy League hotshot. No, 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 no. 
Now he uh, he is a guy who like the the Bartolo family was like, we need to get a mob lawyer out to run the 49ers. And this guy is going to tell us what we can do that's legal and what we and, you know, like that. that I mean, it's just it's very obvious what they were doing. Right. They want a guy to tell them how to color inside the lines. Right. To me, like, to you know, th- like there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that suggests that the DeBartolo family was involved in organized crime, but, but none of them were ever convicted um, of specifically participating in, you know, like on, on some sort of Rico case or racketeering or something like that, that would very directly link them to the mafia. They were, they were got in trouble for other stuff, but, but, but not for that specifically. So here's my theory of what was happening, Joe, and, and you can tell me how you feel about this. So my suspicion like, why would this contractor from Youngstown get all of these contracts to build malls all over the United States and not somebody else, not somebody in a big city with more connections? Or- hide, dead, hide dead bodies. <laughs> Whoa, that's, that's a whole different direction than what I was thinking of. Um, <laughs> maybe. I mean, my- Concrete? I, no, I mean, just my idea was that, like, he was just, like, the guy who would play along. The Bartolo's not going to ask questions. The Bartolo's not going to make any noise. The Bartolo's a he's one of us. He's a friendly guy. And so you need to, you know, you need to build a big real estate thing and 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 uh do this, you know, whatever deal in your city. And uh, get Eddie. Eddie's Eddie'll do it. You know, like <laughs> Eddie he's your guy. He's not going to fuck around. He's not going to you know he's not going to make any way. He's not going to. He's not going to say that uh, there's inventory missing. He's not going to. He's not going to look at the books. You know, like Eddie is the guy who's uh, you know, who's a safe guy, right? Like that, that. He he didn't need to necessarily participate directly in mafia planning. He could just be a guy that the mafia used because they knew he wasn't going to ask questions. That's my theory of how he made his billions. I'm not sure if that's that makes true. sense. Um, yeah, that makes. But sense. I mean, I'm I am sure 100. percent You know. Yes. Right. Yeah. Because absolutely. The mob, the mob doesn't exist in a vacuum. No. I mean, the mob exists as a part of a larger economy that's like willing to interact with the mob. Yes. You know. Yeah. And uh, and so you know, I just wanted to sort of put a pin in that. That uh, that uh, yeah, that's uh, that's where the money's from. And um, so according to Mulde- Dan Moldea's book, uh, there is an astonishing number of mob connections to the NFL more generally. I am not a sports person. I don't know about the internal politics of the NFL or whatever. But to me, it does not appear that there is anybody who is saying that games are fixed, that people are rigging the outcomes of games. Like, that's not something that happens. But what does happen, and the reason that the mafia is extremely interested in owning sports teams, is the same reason that stock traders are interested in having uh, information sources inside of corporations. Uh, That if the mafia is integrated with the ownership structure of an NFL team, then they have access to information that helps them set the odds on betting markets. Uh, it, it, It helps them more efficiently uh, tilt the odds of betting markets toward their favor, right? So if you have Eddie D running the the 49ers and Eddie D is working with Carmen Policy uh who is a mob lawyer and Carmen Policy is able to give inside information that other people would not be privy to to bookmakers back in Youngstown or Tampa or wherever they're leveraging private information in a public forum to their own advantage i think it's interesting to note that there's almost no doubt that the San Francisco 49ers were purchased with ill-gotten gains, right? They were purchased with mafia money. And the mafia was integrated into their operations at like every level of the franchise. I do not think that that is limited to the San Francisco 49ers, right? Like that, that, uh, that I think that there's good reason to suppose that that is um, a systemic problem. Uh, across professionals. So we have to rate your billionaire. I know. We do We do have to rate Denise de Bartolo York, and we've gone so far afield of her. Uh, it's like she's kind of just like a business person. They were big Obama people and like donors, and like she does like philanthropy that doesn't seem totally evil, but she doesn't do very much of it. She's just sort of like your standard, you know, 
very boring, very low profile billionaire. However, like I, I want to give her a four because her fortune should immediately be liquefied and redistributed to the citizens of Youngstown. Because I think we got to give her at least a five if her money came from mafia money. Okay. So you want to, well, I wasn't sure if you would want to raise the bar if she hadn't personally participated i wasn't sure how, how you'd feel about that i am happy with a five because i think it's a very ill-gotten fortune uh because i i you know as i said uh i'm from uh pittsburgh and the collapse of the steel industry there it's really hard to uh, impress upon people how severe that was for the area uh if you haven't seen it or, or spend any time around the aftermath. Um, the thing about Pittsburgh though, is that it recovered largely. I mean, it's, it's a different city now in a lot of ways, but like it, it cra- was able to craft a new identity for itself. And Cleveland also was able to craft a new identity for itself. And it might be lagging a little bit behind Pittsburgh, but Cleveland, I think is well on its way to being like a major and cool American city. Youngstown has not yeah, you know, the 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 aftermath of the mafia completely taking over civic institutions, uh, ju- when the steel industry collapsed, it just evacuated. Like nothing was left. It lost more than half of its population. It is still in extreme poverty. One, you know, like uh, uh, as a whole, um, it's a it's a it's a really fucked up place. And yes. Uh, capitalism is to blame, but also mafia capitalism is to blame, right? Like that, it, that the the, ma- the mafia made the the problem so much worse. Uh, um, and so all of that blood, all of that suffering, is tied to Denise de Bartolo York's fortune. And if she had any sort of conscience at all, she would immediately redistribute all of that money to the citizens of. Uh, Youngstown, but the fact that she's holding on to it means that, uh, you know, she deserves a substantial number. And uh, so five, I'm good with five. Uh, all right, Joe, uh, I, I do know that your billionaire for today is also an NFL owner. Uh, I can't he is. remember his name. Um, his name is Jeffrey L- Lurie. Lurie? Lurie? How do you spell it? L-U, um, like John Lurie? Like John Lurie, yeah, L-U-R-I-E. You're saying it like like uh, like I say it, Lurie. I'm just saying it the only way I can get it out. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like Midwestern people say Lurie. <laughs> John Lurie. Uh, yeah, I mean, he's a, he's a movie producer and owner of the Philadelphia Eagles. And, you know, in terms of the kind of things we like to talk about on the show, he is mostly an uninteresting person. <laughs> he, came from, <laughs> he came from money. His grandfather, Philip Smith, founded General Cinema Theater Chain. Oh, I, yeah. I can't, I, I don't know that I know that. I, maybe I should. I don't remember ever hearing that in my lifetime. Anyway. It's a it's a large company that owned drive-in movie theaters across the United States. Oh, okay. In the 1960s, the company began to diversify its holdings and eventually morphed into the multi-billion-dollar conglomerate Harcourt General. Oh, okay. Lurie himself went to Clark University in Boston and has a doctorate in social policy from Brandeis. Before he entered the business world, he also, interestingly enough, worked as an adjunct professor of social policy at Boston University. And uh, what uh, what kind of social policies does the billionaire have? Is it? (laughs) I don't know. Well, clearly he didn't. What you got to do is you got to you got to try to condense the wealth into as few hands as possible, and then (laughs) it gets so the ball gets so tight of of wealth that then it explodes and then it showers down to like a pinata. It showers down to everybody else. (laughs) And that's how you have a good society. No, I mean, clearly he was not going to live out his career as an academic coming from the kind of money that he came from. He, He pivoted back to the family business and as a Hollywood producer, his films have won two Academy Awards. His film 
the the documentary Inside Job. I, I remember that. Uh, which our listeners will probably probably know was about the financial crisis of the late aughts. So definitely relevant to themes of the show. And he also won or his short documentary that he produced, uh, Innocent, about a homeless, undocumented teenager in California, won an Academy Award as well. So he's had some success. It is, it's pretty weird. And a, a professor of social policy uh, who does movies about how um, uh, speculative investing uh, is bad for society. So it, it would seem like he has a social policy that aligns with the ideas in that film. right? And, um, and he's a billionaire. Uh, that's pretty weird. We're pretty weird combo. I wonder how he sort of resolves that cognitive dissonance for himself. He contains multitudes. I guess you got to. You got to contain those what multitudes. He's, <laughs> <laughs> what he's most well known for is being the owner of the Philadelphia Eagles. So if you're an Eagles fan, you probably know him. He acquired the team back in the early 90s and won his first Super Bowl back in 2018 versus the Patriots. Interestingly, Lurie had wanted to buy the Patriots back in like the late 80s or early 90s or something, and Kraft beat him out. And so like the Eagles was like his second attempt to get involved in the NFL. And originally he was like very nervous about the investment because in the early 90s, it was not at all clear that the value of these teams would skyrocket over the next 20 years as they have. Yeah. I mean, I think probably much of his net worth now is wrapped up in his stake in the Eagles. Because Lurie owns the Philadelphia Eagles and also because of the fact that, Chad, your uh, billionaire this week was also an NFL owner, I'm going to spend my segment talking about the history of American football. Okay. And... <laughs> I'd like to begin by saying that I I truly and sincerely enjoy watching football. I probably have mentioned this on the show before. Uh -huh. It's not my favorite sport, but I've actually become much more like invested in it in, in recent years. It's, I don't know. I find Who, myself who's watching your team? it. Well, it's got to be... Uh... It's well, got to be the Green Bay Packers now, right? Now it's the Packers. You know, I lived in Western New York for a period of time, and I was a Bills fan when I was there. Oh, yeah. Do you care about the Steelers at all anymore? I mean, if they won no. the Super Bowl, uh, would that make you happy? It would not. Um, I think that the league should be dismantled, and they shouldn't be allowed to play the sport anymore because it's been conclusively determined that it gives you brain damage. Well... You are right and just to reject <laughs> this game on the grounds of violence and, and corruption. And today I'd like to talk about the utter and complete corruptness that is the NFL. Uh, and, you know, in spite of my uh, affection for the game at a certain level, my plan is to look back for a minute at the origins of, of the sport and then trace a quick and dirty history of the value system that sort of defines the sport today. Okay. You know, this is a sort of project that like deserves a lot more time in order to, to execute it in a fully convincing way. We would need more research and we'd need to explore it in a, in, in a lot more depth, but there's some interesting moments that I found going back into the history books that I think are illuminating and at least sort of shed a certain sort of light on. Uh, why the NFL is the way it is t t today. I'd like to begin by quoting an article published a few years ago in Sports Illustrated, written by Charles Pierce, entitled, Can the NFL Escape the Depths of Its Own Corruption? <laughs> Just to give a bit of a setup here, Pierce begins this article by spinning out a little anecdote about a lawyer named Owen Roberts who back in 1925 was hired by the United States Congress to investigate the Teapot Dome scandal. Uh -oh. This is a scandal that I feel like I'd heard about but forgotten about. Uh, I had to look up. But it, it was a, it basically, you all may know out there, listeners, um, a scandal involving the secret leasing of oil reserves in California. Uh, so it was basically just kind of an inside job type of deal. The story that 
Pierce tells in this article involves a U.S. senator warning Owens not to discuss his investigation into the scandal with the U.S. Attorney General, because the U.S. Attorney General and the Harding administration were basically in on the scam. And it was just sort of advice not to trust anybody because you're going in, you're going in deep on this one. So, okay, now I'll quote a few sentences directly from the article. Quote, sometimes the corruption of an institution is so deep and so thoroughgoing that it becomes the life force of the institution. It is more than the cost of doing business. It is itself the business that is being done. Sometimes the corruption in an institution is so positively endemic that it makes a sad mockery of Juvenal's ancient warning, quis custodiet ipsos custodes, who guards the guards themselves. And Juvenal was a satirist by trade, but neither he nor Owen Roberts lived long enough to confront the writhing ball of snakes that is the National Football League. <laughs> so yeah, okay. a little convoluted, <laughs> this but is, I get the point. <laughs> but in any event, this, this is this is four years ago, right? And I would argue that most of the points that this article goes on to make are just as valid, if not more valid, today, especially because of the recent research and studies and in, into CTE. Yeah, NFL's not great at cleaning up its act. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to discuss some of the reasons why the NFL should or could be considered a writhing ball of snakes and <laughs> how it's actually really been this way from the very, very beginning. And I guess that's what's kind of interesting to me. Um, we'll see if it turns out to be interesting for you. So American football is essentially an outgrowth of soccer, but more directly rugby football. The origin of all of these these sports are are you can trace them back to ancient times, but legend has it that rugby was first established at the rugby school in England in 1823. In the in the 1860s and 70s, college clubs in America were playing rugby but experimenting with the rules, uh, changing the game, modifying it in various ways, and then in Eight in in the in the eighteen eighties, a guy named Walter Camp, who is now known as the father of American football, proposed a series of rules like the snapback and the down system and the Classic point system. Rules. That some of the best, yeah, rules. these rule changes <laughs> more or less brought the the game that we know today into existence. Here's a fun fact: an aside. People call the first professional game of football, quote, professional, a game that took place in 1892 when a man named William Pudge <laughs> Heffelfinger was paid $500 by the Allegheny Athletic Club to compete against, uh, as as it turns out, the Pittsburgh Athletic Club. Pudge? Old Pudge Heffelfinger, huh? Old Pudge. Yeah. <laughs> But back to back to Walter Camp. He was a prolific writer and published a whole bunch of books, many of which were specifically about football. And I skimmed a fair bit of his writing in preparation for today's show. And there's a lot of different things that I could pull out. But here's just one detail I wanted to share. Near the beginning of a book titled Keeping Fit All the Way... <laughs> <laughs> Which is, I don't, I kind of like that name, like sort of double rainbow all the way, kind of. <laughs> uh, R.I.P. <laughs> R.I.P. Which, if you couldn't guess, is is basically about why exercise is good for you. He he offers this sort of prefatory statement at the beginning of the book. <clears throat> In this section, he titles, quote, An American Creed. And I'm just going to read a sentence or two of this just to give you a flavor. Quote, I believe that a nation should be made up of people who individually possess clean, strong bodies and pure <laughs> minds. <laughs> oh, <laughs> clean and pure is those are big red flag words. <laughs> oh my god! Uh, who have respect for their own rights and the rights of others, and possess courage and strength to redress wrongs. And finally, in whom self-consciousness is sufficiently powerful to preserve these qualities, I believe in education, patriotism, justice, and loyalty. I believe in civil and religious liberty and in the freedom of thought and speech. Uh, blah, 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 blah. 
He goes on to say some things about chivalry, straight speaking, and conquering, envy, and the dignity of labor, a, a, a bunch of platitudinous nonsense, basically. The point is that I think Camp's American creed gives you a pretty clear sense of how he's trying to represent himself and, by extension, the, the sport of football, because he was at this time like one of the sport's most visible spokespeople to the to the world. So he's associating it. He's he's associating it with a kind of ideological context, right? Like the, the yeah. This is this is the world that football occupies. The world of these values, right? Which is very similar to the values uh, that. I imagine people would associate with baseball during that time, right? Like, right. But also, if you were to like go and read an NFL mission statement or value <laughs> statement today, yeah, yeah. it would be very. It would be like in modern language. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it'd be very similar. You know. Yeah. Um. So, but what you need to know about Walter Camp is that he he was also clearly so very very full of shit. You know, I mean, would you, you could have seen that coming just from the kind of rhetoric that he wields. So, for example, in his book titled The Book of Football, published in 1910, he writes, quote, a gentleman never competes for money directly or indirectly. Make no mistake about this. <laughs> OK, well, in fact, <laughs> he actually presided over an alumni funded slush fund of $100,000 at Yale that he used to pay for gifts and vacations for star players and also to like bring in ringers for big games. Well, I mean, and, Joe, if, what? well, you're assuming that he considered himself a gentleman. Maybe he considered himself <laughs> a scurrilous rogue or something. <laughs> But I would have appreciated it if he'd come clean on that. And that, I, sir, am a scurrilous hey, rogue, which I absolutely <laughs> am not. It's just ridiculous. So, but it, like, it, it was so his slush fund was so notorious and kind of out in the open, or I guess like there were enough rumors about it that at one point he was actually investigated, and there was a like big muckrakers expose about the slush fund in McClure's magazine. He was also a major champion of the game during a time when it was becoming very obvious that this game was incredibly dangerous. <laughs> that's a thing. Like that's a dynamic since its inception. It's always been like, well, we, we need to add this pad now and we need to add this rule now because people just constantly are getting injured and killed. And like, it's ne it's never escaped that shadow. Dude, right? like, check this out. This 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 stat kind of blew my mind. Between 1900 and 1905, at least 45 football players died playing football. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've played football. It's not that fun. It's not it's not worth <laughs> taking a chance that you will die. But I mean, uh, can you imagine if 12 football players in the NFL a year were dying? That's uh, like that's uh, that is very weird to think about. But like, I mean, it, it strikes me that like that has to be part of its appeal. Right. So like if it ever became such that the public understood that with the new technologies and rules and pads in place, uh, football would would never be a threat to human life or or a debilitating in injury. Interest would think, completely I, I, collapse. Yeah, yeah. I wonder <laughs> yeah. if people would be interested in it at, at all, right? Like, um, yeah. I don't know, I, you know, but uh, but I, I, I'm curious about that. Like, I wonder if they self-consciously understand that as part of their marketing strategy. It's an interesting argument. I, mean, I, I for one, don't think so. I mean, there might be a certain contingent of people who's like... Really... But wouldn't they be quicker to act? Like, as soon as they saw, I don't know, one death or one uh, broken neck or one, like, uh, case of CTE, then they would be like, oh, okay, let's, we got to figure out a way to fix this immediately, <laughs> right? Like, uh, like why, why not fix problems in, unless you want the problems? Well, uh, w well, Walter to... Camp clearly liked the, the problems. I mean, I'll get to this in a second. <laughs> like, he liked that, th that mode of play. I just wanted to mention that the level of violence got so bad 
that an, a, a kind of infamous cartoon was published in 1905 in the Cincinnati Commercial Tribune that you can go find, or maybe we can link to, that that depicts a grim reaper perched on the goal posts in the end zone of a football field, just sort of looming over a bunch of mangled football player bodies, <laughs> 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 which is like, I mean, it's sort of horrifying. Yeah. Um, but it's sort but, of like also what the sport currently is. Yeah. I mean, like, well, yeah, yeah. It's just a little bit more backstage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't get to see them die. No, the death they, doesn't happen on the field, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Um, so interestingly, Teddy Roosevelt gets involved in this situation because his son got injured while playing football at Harvard. Because he's a barrel chested man with a, a love of manly sports. That's right. And he like stepped up to try to negotiate reform for the game to, uh, make it safer. Mm -hmm. But as I was alluding to a second ago, Walter Camp was vehemently anti-reform. He was basically pro-brutality. He didn't want the rules to change. And I, I looked into this a little bit. I think it's it's complicated because I think the Harvard style, there was a Harvard-Yale rivalry that I'm, I'm sure people are aware of. And they had different styles of play. And I think that the brutality favored Yale's strategy, you know, mm, but right. in any event, Walter Camp didn't seem too concerned about the shocking death rate of football players in the, in the not his problem. Walter Camp didn't seem to care about the death or about the injuries. So, okay, I guess I mentioned this just to to point out that at its core, as you were sort of saying too, Chad, American football is inherently violent and militaristic. And okay, like it's hard to like say something that's more obvious. We all know this. And also people have pointed this out in millions of ways in so many moments. Uh, before the show, Chad, you, you turned me on to the George Carlin bit about baseball and football. Thank you for doing it. It's absolutely great. I can't believe I hadn't encountered it before. And finally, the objectives of the two games are totally different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, otherwise known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy, in spite of the blitz, even if he has to use the shotgun. With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing this aerial assault with a sustained ground attack which punches holes in the forward wall of the enemy's defensive line. So I checked out this other book from, from the same sort of historical period called American Football by player and coach Charles Dudley Daly. And this... Dud. this <laughs> this this book he begins and these are the very first words of the book like you you see the table of contents chapter one <laughs> first words quote a remarkable similarity exists between war and football <laughs> and then so in many places over the course of this book he goes on to elaborate on this point like the beginning of chapter three begins quote football is a war game <laughs> you know, like his entire, he also, I like served in the army or something. He was a military guy. So clearly he's like looking at the game through that lens. I guess so. I mean, but it's a, like a weird thing to imagine that he just discovered that there and it wasn't designed into the game from the game. It was like, absolutely <laughs> designed into the game from the game. Brutality and militarism are part of the DNA of football and in no way a recent development. We're just yeah. dealing with that legacy. So, I mean, okay, so I kind of wish we had more time so that we could explore all of the different steps that that led to where we are now. But let's just fast forward to today. And the, the, the past few years, we've revealed ample evidence that the NFL has essentially tried to rig research that was being perf performed by the National Institute of Health about traumatic brain injuries and CTE. And... They like placed their own scientists 
there to try to produce the results that would benefit them and the league. Right. As research has continued to come out, it's increasingly clear that CTE is a major problem and the NFL is pretty much behaving like just like the tobacco industry, as far as I can tell. That's the impression that I get. You yeah. know, the, they, the NFL is behaving toward its players as the tobacco industry was behaving toward all smokers. Yeah. Um, it's corporate denialism. Which is abhorrent. There's a, there's, a, there's a standardized playbook, right? It's the same thing that the any sort of extraction industry does, the same thing that the tobacco industries do, the same thing that anybody does, or chemical companies that harm people. There's just a, a corporate denialism playbook and the, the NFL is following it just like all of the toxin producers. Right? Yeah. 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 That should tell yeah. you something about <laughs> what the what the the sport is, right? One hundred percent. So there's this history of violence and and negligence that goes back to the origins of the sport, but I think we also absolutely in this moment need to talk about the history of racism that has made the sport what it is today. So, Chad, are you aware of the comments that Roger Goodell has made in the past few days in response to? the Black Lives Matter movement and the sort of change in stance that the NFL is having in relation to all of this new activism? No, I was actually blissfully unaware that the NFL had decided it needed to weigh in. Um, what, uh, what did they... Uh, well, so yeah, they, I mean, you know, they, why, you know why they need to to weigh in. I mean, you, this is this relates I actually to am, your am, segment. Yeah, I'm uh, not completely up on the uh the nfl politics uh so well so yeah, like let, your let your segment was great i loved hearing about youngstown and i'm really glad that you went in that direction because it was interesting and i had no idea about it the more obvious direction to have gone would have been to talk about colin kaepernick who was was the quarterback for the san francisco 49ers and of course like Oh shit! Lost his job. <laughs> I was, yeah. And I actually yeah. am so disengaged from it that I, I. So he was the quarterback for the 49ers. Correct. Uh, yeah, and he like led them to a Super Bowl, and 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 then within a couple of years after he started kneeling, no one in the NFL would give him a job. Right. Okay. Yeah. I, I mean, I knew that. I just didn't know. I didn't know the team. Yeah. Well, it was your team. But in any event, so. <laughs> that's very, very embarrassing. I think we should re-record this episode <laughs> <laughs> such that I don't look like a complete asshole. Yeah, yeah no, well, maybe. We, yeah, we'll look into it. <laughs> so um, at the time, no one in the NFL backed him up. Roger Goodell and the league stood against him and no, no one with his pedigree or performance history had ever been denied employment by the NFL ever before, but suddenly he couldn't get a job. And so the league wound up settling a collusion case that he brought against him last year. So it's very obvious that the league and the owners gathered behind closed doors and agreed not to hire Kaepernick because they didn't like the image he was bringing to the, to the, to the league with his kneeling um in support of the black lives matter movement. so what you're saying is that they were able to op they were able to make a decision and act on that decision very quickly whenever it came to doing something racist uh but whenever it comes to doing anything to protect the safety of the the people who make them all their money it takes them years and years of hemming and hawing and right, deferrals yeah, right. before they can ever do yes anything. so Roger Goodell this past or in the, in the past few weeks after all of the demonstrations after George Floyd has come out and said we were wrong the NFL should support the Black Lives Matter movement and he's although he didn't apologize to Kaepernick in his public statement he has I think elsewhere said that he encourages team owners to give him a shot. And so it's, it's an interesting, it's an interesting moment. I mean, I mean, there's so much other stuff that we could talk about with the NFL and its role in society, but I guess, I mean, it's like the NFL is uniquely American. 
there's a, a, in the words of one New York Times article that we can link to. Indeed, with the exception of Disney's assorted properties, no cultural product <laughs> unites Americans the way the NFL does. And so I guess my question is like, what, what, what can we take away? How can we learn more about ourselves from this institution? Do you have any like theories about how the NFL is working on our consciousness? Well, no, I mean, I, I, I have an idea about how it is quintessentially American, right? Which is, you know, one of the things that's been extremely depressing to me over the past couple of weeks is that um, I it just like realized a real a fundamental characteristic of the uh, of the American worldview is uh, that it's not worth making the smallest and most insignificant sacrifice to to accomplish any uh, social goal. So like the thing, you know, it's like wearing wearing a mask hmm. is the one that people are talking about, right? Like I am, I like is it, it like there's really. There's very little downside to wearing a mask. It's like uh, it's maybe a little bit, uh, you know, a, a, a little bit uncomfortable to breathe or something. There's no downside to wearing it, right? People don't don't want to do it because they don't fucking want to do it, even though it will protect a lot of people. We do the same thing with guns, right? Like we we are yeah. we are extremely happy to uh, watch uh, tens of thousands of people die uh, so that we don't have so we aren't we aren't required to register our, our guns or, uh, uh, you know, uh, have a background check or put uh, trigger guards on guns or, you know, like what, or whatever, right? Like that uh, yeah. we are, we are incredibly unwilling to make small sacrifices. And to me, it, it, like that's what football is about too. Like, uh, like we are absolutely unwilling to make these uh, small concessions to uh, what we see as the integrity of our game to save human beings lives. Right. Like we could easily yeah, do right. this and it really wouldn't be too much effort. It really wouldn't even change that much. It's not a really a big <laughs> deal, but we will 100 percent never do this because <laughs> that's yeah, that's our identity. God, that's right. I mean, it's, it's interesting because we, we've got to rate this guy, Jeffrey Lurie. And when you put it in that context, I think I he's wanna... very full of shit because he's living in a world of of uh, extreme hypocrisy, right? Like maybe we have to like... give him the same as Di Bartolo. The question is, what do we rate him? I mean, I think a five is good. Like if you own an NFL team, that's a very messed up thing. And if you're just a billionaire in the first place, right? Like, I mean, I guess ju just being a billionaire and not not actively causing any other harm in the world, I guess that's got to be a one, right? Like. Uh, on our scale, I think it's got to be like a three because a one has to be like you are a billionaire, but you were also aggressive. Also doing do good. good. So you can. OK, yeah. so, you know, you know, you know we're going to have to like discuss the intricacies of this rating scale. I know each well, time we do it, it becomes to, we've been trying to new, get it a long time. New yeah. complexities make themselves uh, appear. Right. Uh, reveal themselves to us. Uh, I mean, he's a four uh, or five. I think both of our both of our billionaires this week are fours or fives. If yeah. yours was a five, mine. Well, mafia, though. <laughs> movie theaters versus mafia i'm a four yeah i like that i yeah. think that my guy was a little bit worse so I, let's do four yeah four four i think it's fair All right, Chad, let's look at the let's let's spin that wheel for next episode to find out which billionaires we have to research our next. Right, assignment. You don't sound very enthused about that. I'm never very enthused, but I'm doing it for the people. <laughs> OK. All right. Let's spin the wheel. First. Oh, it's pretty high on the list. Uh, so this is going to be a relatively rich person. Number 106, Randa Duncan Williams. And I think this might be a first. Randa Duncan Williams? Yes. And the uh and 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 she is I think a she is is uh part of a family of Duncans. Uh and there it appears that there are four of them. And I think we should maybe do them together. Okay. Uh, they are in the business of pipelines. I do not think that we've had a pipeline billionaire. Okay. Yet. 
all right, I kind of am interested in that, but let's yeah. let's see who the next person is. This has never happened before. The random selector picked number five out of 640. It picked, it hit on five. Who is it? Mark Zuckerberg. <laughs> oh my God. Do we have to do them? Actually, let's do them. You do them. It's kind of a good time to be doing them because he's like, right. because of all the shit with Facebook and. Twitter oh, and Trump. And, it, it seems so exhausting. I mean, we could we could just say no. We're not gonna. We refuse to do Mark Zuckerberg because he's not. I mean, we have to do them all. Let's do it. I, I, maybe I'll talk about his hairstyles. I don't know. We'll figure out something fun to do. And and you know what? Zuckerberg God. is off the fucking list, and that the, we'll the, never we, have to do it again. God, that's it. It's this done. is such a miserable assignment that we've taken on. <laughs> Thanks everybody for continuing to listen and like and subscribe and all those things and we'll be back again whatever a few weeks we're going to we're going to drop another episode in mid July. That's the plan, right? Yeah. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> all right, stay safe folks. <laughs> <laughs>